I'm Ruben, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, functional programming. And the, the, the title is a, uh, uh, quite misguided because the examples are in JavaScript, but functional programming, uh, or at least this presentation, has nothing to do with JavaScript at all. Just I need a language to make some code. OK, so who am I? I'm uh, the lead uh, front-end developer at Lulabox. And uh, Lulabox, in case you don't know, it's an online supermarket where you sure, if you are not already, uh, you can make your, it's like a, like a normal grocery. So you actually can make, I, 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 was, I was saying, you can buy food, but you can actually buy everything, like uh, food, things for the, uh, for the house, like we have even, if I don't remember, but microwaves, so, but especially food. Um, I mean, why you, why you should believe me is because uh, I've been working with JavaScript since I started developing. So this is more than three years ago. It's not too much, but if you're working a lot every day, there are quite thousands of lines of, of code. And this, all, of all this time, the past year, I've been working almost full time uh, with uh, functional uh, programming paradigms. Uh, and this is important because there is a lot of people, uh, not only in Barcelona, but around the world, who's starting functional programming now, right? Uh, it's important to have, in, for all the paradigms, all the language, some background, so you actually face the common problems that all the ecosystems have. Uh, so, yep, we are going to talk about uh, functional programming, and it's, it's an introduction. Uh, I'm going to try to start from the very beginning, because there are some things that change quite a lot, comparing with other languages. And we will try to reach a point where you can actually continue exploring functional programming by yourself. So, let's go. This is, like, the very basic for functional programming and has very little to do with actually code, okay? So this is the two pillars of functional programming. In case you don't know, deterministic, uh, well, we're gonna review in deep later, but deterministic is, you can think about a code that whatever you get this, the sum input, uh, you will get always the same output, right? So like the, the signature or the values of the signature will always uh, determine the, the output. And declarative is just the opposite of imperative, which is the, the most common paradigm, especially with object oriented programming. And it's just a way, it's a paradigm actually, that you go to, um, telling the, the language what you want to have, not how to have it, right? So there's gonna, reviewed. Um, here it goes, and deterministic example. This, uh, most of the examples are with ES6 in JavaScript. So this is, in, in case anyone knows, this, an, an this is a function, it's an arrow function, which takes the argument and returns the, in this case, plus plus x. So if we get this number, we get the, the number plus one. So what's the importance of deterministic? As I told you, uh, given a particular input, you always get uh, the same output. And this is a concept that, that it's super important. It's taken from calculus. And this enables um, programming as if it was um, equations. This, this is something that we talk later, but this is called referential transparency. And the important thing is that this will makes all the code more simple smaller, not smaller in lines, but like in units of code, which in JavaScript will be functions, and in, in, in functional languages, it, they are always uh, functions. Um, and therefore, by extension, composable. And we make it late, we, we, we go in deep later. Um, for the coders that are in, in the room, think about a state machine. A state machine is the the, the final example for a deterministic code, right? Where you get always uh, a lot of inputs, right? And if the input is always the same, you get the same output. The opposite will be something like a, 
um, neuronal network where you, you, you input the same uh, data one time and again and again and so on, and maybe you get different outputs because you don't know the relationships that are, that are being made inside. So important, this is avoiding side effects, spoilers. And the other pillar is declarative, right? Uh, instead of saying that here, by the way, we are just getting the, those who fill this statement, which is the, the modulus of two should be one, so false. <laughs> Complex code, my bad. Whatever, the, the idea is that I'm not saying to the code how to do the things. I want pairs, right? So I'm not actually going through the, uh, give me this and then check if the value is bigger than and, and then so on and blah, 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 blah. It's like, no, I, I just want this result. So this, this idea here is maybe too simple, but you will say something like, I want filter those where x are x, then filter those where x are x modulus two, and then I want to map it, and then I want to, so you are making a smaller uh, units of code. Here's this important thing with declarative. So what we're doing, we're unlocking purity, and we're unlocking no side effects. What's purity? In case you don't know, a uh, pure function is the function that is deterministic, so it takes an input, returns always the same output, but it also never rely on external sources. It never calls another function. Uh, this function, if it's pure, is not gonna use maybe a flag or you know, another um, scalar or a structure that you have around or class or whatever. Uh, actually, this is one of the, well, it's one of the ways you get to ensure the deterministic, right? So it's you have uh, the determinism helps you to have purity, but purity also helps you to have determinism. Don't worry. And the side effects. Uh, I guess that all of you know what side effects, but yeah. Well, one question. Um, I didn't get very good the difference between uh, functional and, and the other one that was uh, like declarative. No? Can, can you go? Ah, deterministic. Deterministic and declarative. You mean? Whoops. Go back? Doesn't go back. I will go back, but it doesn't go. Don't worry. Deterministic and declarative, you mean? Yeah, within the two examples that you uh, explained, declarative, yeah, this one, yeah. But the deterministic one, I... So the, the first one. First one. <coughs> this example, you mean? Yeah, I didn't get the very good response. So the idea is that... Um, let me continue. Okay. Because I have a better example. What, what, what can happen, right? So we want to review the, the opposite, the errors. So I was telling you about the side effects, which is important, Let, let's see, but the, now I'm going to the question. Side effects are uh, these situations that you, you don't expect and you don't actually want it to happen, right? So if I'm adding, uh, I have a function which uh, adds two numbers, right? It's a sum. Uh, and I pass to the function two and two, I will expect a four, but never a five or another number, right? So if I get a five, there will be a, a side effect. Import here is the basic example, but maybe you have race conditions or in, in, in distributed systems, whatever, right? You can have more complex problems. Difficult to debug. So side effects, here is the, like the first example you were asking for. So this is a, whoops, side effects. This is a, um, and non-deterministic code. Because you cannot know what will be the return of plus every time you execute it. At the first time execution, it will return uh, 1338. But at the second execution, it will return 1339, and so on. So there is, you cannot guarantee at any point that you know the answer of the execution. Because this code is not deterministic, but it's also relying on an external source, right? So this is the opposite as before. In case you want to add an, an, a number, you will pass always x as a parameter and so on. You were concatenating the, the function calls. Um, yeah, that's quite important. And then the imperator imperative. Uh, it's like, as I told you before, the important, the, he, here we are making few things, right? We are relying on external sources and so on. 
but we also say how we want the information. I want it in an array, and I want to push the resource, yada, yada, right? If I want more things, I will add everything here in the, in the, blog, in the blog statement, and so on. Uh, for me, at least, the more important thing between imperative and declarative, both are okay, depending on what you're doing, but the most important thing is that with declarative, you have a more maintainable code because it's less hard to reason about, right? It's more clear in a quick view to understand what's doing. If you have a small functions or a small uh, unit of code. So the, the principles. Um, again, this is not actually a binded to, to the code. The, those are in, a, in an abstract way. And all of them came from mathematics, and especially category uh, theory. Uh, so first class citizens, what, what does it mean? All the language have first class citizens. Just in the case on the function programming, functions are first class citizens. And a first class citizens is a, a unit of a structure, you can call it like that, that uh, can be operated as all the other scalars. So a scalar, right, is like a, an integer or a float or whatever, or a string, right? In JavaScript, uh, function is a first class citizen because you can actually pass it as arguments on other functions. A function can return uh, another function. A function can be chained. Function can be operated as any other scalar. So this is the, the first principle that you need in a language in order to say that you're doing or you are working with functional programming. Um, <laughs> This, this, this came from, from calculus, and the, the most important thing, like the, the abstract for the first class uh, function, is that you can, as I told you, pass it as arguments and return it as outputs, right? Because this enab enables higher order functions, which will enable the composability that I'm talking about. Uh, here's a higher order function. A higher order function is a function which intakes or outputs another function. That's a more basic example. Usually, we call higher order functions to those functions which actually return functions, right? It depends on the language also. I told you it's abstract thing. Uh, and here we have, instead of having, this, this is curry, right? It's, this is a curry at function because usually you may have a, a poll uh, function, right? And you pass two arguments, the two and the five. And here we are chaining the function calls. So curry is basically a set of or, or a chain of functions, which every function takes just one argument and exposes to the next closure. And the, here, this will be a closure, and this will be the other closure, right? This closure can access exponent, but this closure cannot access base, right? It's, it's just a nested call, um, right? Yep. So. Immutability is the other important principle because if you think about, I told you that the, the purity, you cannot rely on external sources and so on, so what happens when I want to change states or I want to actually change the value, right? So what you do is uh, return an, a, a new one, right? Instead of changing n in this case, we are constructing a new scalar called m from n, right? It's a stupid example. We are just changing three for 11. But the, the idea is that you are never changing the values, right? The values are immutable. Um, among all the things related to performance, yada, yada, that all the people are talking, you again are forcing a, a, a proper maintainability and a code which is less hard to reason about and so on. All, all, all the benefits that we're talking about uh, the idea here is to remake instead of change values. Okay, so let's go a bit in deep. I, I guess that it's, it's clear, everything from now, since now, I don't know. Okay, so map reduce, functor, and monads. I, I'm completely sure that you actually listened these terms before, but there is a lot of people who explain it like in a very scientific way and not like for coders, right? Well, maybe someone here is working in the university or whatever. But important things, this comes from category theory, which is the abstract thing. It's a field of the mathematics, which study the 
the numbers in groups. So think about the Venn diagram, right? The, the bubbles uh, which fill up one with the other. This is category theory. We are just comparing sets of groups. Um, important thing, MapReduce. Um, nothing too complex, right? This is the base for a lot of technologies uh, nowadays. Like in JavaScript, we are like forcing this kind of uh, modifying the, the values, but also like uh, big data, machine learning, they are relaying a lot of the concept of MapReduce, especially because the, the, the easy of think about performance and composability, right? You can think about this like a pipe. So I want to map, imagine that here, instead of saying uh, the callback itself, it says, uh, this, this, this will be like multiplied by two, and here says uh, sum everything. So you, you can change things. You can say, so dot map, and also change the, the, the type to float, and also blah, 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 and yada, yada, yada. So if you have a big data pipeline, like for uh, ba, 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 hype, the, this, this kind of uh, thinking is super powerful because you can actually compose the pipelines that you want to. Okay? And think about the importance uh, related with the immutability, right? You are not changing the data, you are just creating new values. Aha! Uh -huh. So the functor. So bear with me. A functor is an entity that defines a behavior which given a morphism Maps, maps it onto a category and generates a new functor. Brain fuck, completely brain fuck, I know. So this is because it came from mathematics. Let's review it again. The definition is functor, functor is an entity. The F is the functor, right, entity. Which defines a, behave, a behavior. This is the behavior. In this case, the behavior is an non-associative array, blah, 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 object, sorry, blah, blah, blah. In this case, in JavaScript, it's an array, yada, yada, right? Which, uh, given a, sorry, this is the morphism, and this is the behavior, my bad. Yes, morphism, behavior. Behavior, in this case, is super cool. Given some input, return the same, right? Super easy. And map it onto a new functor. G is another functor, right? Why is a functor? Because you can actually make the same thing again on G, right? This, this, this concatenation of things, it's uh, infinite. You can actually be, you, you could be doing map x to x, x to x, x to x forever, right? So this is a functor. Uh, easiest thing to reason about the functor, uh, functor is some scalar which exposes ways to iterate to, to its own and returns another functor. So two things. You have a scalar, right? It can be an array, for example, in JavaScript, which exposes ways, map, reduce, filter, so on, right? Which enables to you to iterate over them, over themselves, right? They are callbacks and they are going, it's an iterative, right? and returns another functor. All the map filter, da, 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 the result is another functor. You can, again, filter map, and that's why you can chain the calls, right? In the, in the previous slide, here what's happening is that map is actually returning another functor, and then you are reducing the new functor. But between here and here, you are not creating, but in, in an abstract way of thinking, you're creating another functor. Uh, Yep, so the monads. Monad is one of the things that I listen to the most complex definitions in my life. Uh, but actually, a monad is a functor that you can flat map. And what does flat map mean? Um, flat map is like a map where the mapper doesn't expect to have the value but a functor. So if we think in the most English way to, 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 to reason about the, the flat map, right? Flat from flatten and the map. Uh, flat map is something that you can do something like this. 
right? This is a fat map which takes the scalar that you can iterate, iterate and then games the mapper and the mapper returns an array, which is another scalar, which is a functor in JavaScript, right? You can map this thing. And this is what doing the, the flat map, is taking the functor and then it's mapping it. Uh, it's a complex syntax in JavaScript, but uh, you are basically, in this case, like um, calling the function map, okay? with this callback to its own and to the values that the previous mapup is returning. This is complex by, by definition. But basically, given, I mean, if you see the input, you see what's doing the map, which is returning maps, right? This will, if, with a normal map, this will return a matrix, right? This will return a, a, a series of seven, one, end of the array, uh, 49, 7, end of the array, 91, end of the array. So the flat map is this mapping also the, the, fun, the functor which is returning the, the, the first mapper. Uh, this is a very basic implementation of a monad, right? A monad would also take a value and handle properly. And you, in a monad, and theoretically, you can pass the, the, fun, the returning of the functor can be any deep inside of the, the, the function called chains, right? So, but, but the idea, right, again, and, and the, the important idea that you can explore is that the, the monad is like a functor, but expects, the, the, the mapper expects another functor. Uh, a real case scenario for this thing, uh, it, it's super common, it's, pretty, it's a quite a stupid, but it's super common. So you, you all have mobiles and you have apps. And most of the apps have lists. And the list, at some points, they have headers, right? Usually, what, what you have uh, is a, a list of sections. And the renders, what, what it's actually doing is flat mapping the sections. So at the first item of every section, they, instead of returning the value, they return another functor, usually an array, that they flat up so they have the, the extra header. This is like a super common example. But and it's a very good example because if you don't use the, the monad, the, the, the flat map, you rely into the imperative coding and you're saying, oh, so if it's the first, then go to the previous array and add one position, which is super costly for the machine and, and so on. So real case scenarios for things that are quite abstract. Like in an imperative, yeah, yeah. It will be like n not only nesting the for loops or whiles or whatever, and other kinds. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Because you rely on the standard sources, but you can make uh, recursion pure. But usually it's functional and, and not pure. Um, yeah, the alternative will be making for loops and not also going to how deep is this, but uh, checking the types because it's if a functor execute the functor. If it's not, then return the value and so on. Um, benefits, okay. Why we want to make uh, functional things? Uh, disclaimer, first of all, uh, as I told you, I'm be, I've been working quite a lot with functional programming right now, and I release a few products full functional to production, so it works, okay? Just in case you want to combine your CTO, he can call me. Um, stateless, stateless is like the the, the straightaway benefit, right? Because if it's pure, if you're not related on external sources and so on, if it's deterministic, then you cannot have an state. And the, the main benefit of not having an state is that it's really difficult to uh, make side effects. It's super difficult because you don't have, this is called idempotent, right? In, in programming, 
is like the last instruction that you get is the true. And that's all. Okay, so the last statement that you get is the true. That, that, that would be the idea. Uh, with a stateful uh, code, the last statement that you get modifies the previous state and then you get a new state, right? So this will be, and the code is quite easy, right? It's like uh, just add, add one number, uh, but always keep the, the value at a maximum. In this case, is, is, is 10. So if we say eight and we pass the max, it says nine. If we say 10, we pass the max, it says 10. This code is still deterministic and pure, right? We don't have the max like a constant here, which is being uh, read inside of the closure, but we are sending on every call the max value that we have. Uh, the opposite will be to have maybe max or maybe the previous value stored somewhere in state and, and using this. Uh, yeah, referential transparency. This is another of the more super abstract things. It came from meta mathematics, in case anyone ever explored the field. And it, it, the idea is not something that you have to do, but it's like some sort of best practices for functional programming. Um, the, the most important thing is it, it promotes thinking about the function as equations, right? And this means, this means one very important thing, that you can replace the values from the right to the left and the final result will be still true, like an equation. Right, so you, you can the property of substitution into an equation. You you have it also in functional programming because it's deterministic and doesn't rely on on the states. Uh, here we have, for example, the square, right? The sum three, and then we have uh, forget the mean for now. So if we concat everything, we get it. That that's cool. Referential transparency is is this thing which is also really related to the maps, filter, it's not about uh, writing code in, in as one-liners, right? But expressing as, as, as equations. Uh, it enables an easy control flow, as I told you before, you can pipe it or you can compose it, so on, whatever you want to. And the other thing that we get with referential transparency uh, is called point-free style, and uh, is this mean function. Point free style is a super fancy name to saying that you don't have arguments. You expect whatever arguments or what, what it's called in functional programming, maybe arguments, right? Which comes from nothing to whatever, any. Uh, mean in this case, I don't know if you ever uh, face this problem in JavaScript that math mean it's a fucker function because it doesn't accept an array you have to pass it as arguments of the function. So it's like, fuck you mean, I'm gonna use my own implementation, which takes whatever they want to pass. We, we, we will be passing also here a flat mappable array, for example, and it will work also. Um, again, bear with me, this is like best practices, nothing religious about. And then it comes the cool thing, composition. It's like, alongside with Maintainability, for me, this is my opinion, this is like the, the other super benefit of functional programming. This is called the gorilla, gorilla banana problem, in case you're never listening about, is I want a banana, but I actually get, with object programming, I want a banana, but to get the banana, I actually need a gorilla and all the fucking jungle. And I don't want neither the gorilla, neither the, neither the jungle. So in this case, you have, for example, uh, we have two functions, full legs, and has clusters. This is doing just basically the first function adds an attribute lex, value, value four, for a given object, and has lasers the same, lasers true, for a given object. So we have a, sounds like a cat, because mm, it, it mews. <laughs> so if sounds like a cat, we added four legs, we have a cat, cool thing, right? But we also, want a very fancy cat. So if to the cat we add lasers, we, fa we have the catenator 4000. Now, this is a fun example, but the important thing will be, imagine how is this in, 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 in the classical object or in the programming, right? 
we have like the animal class, and then it extends, I don't know, um, vertebrates, which extends domestic animals, and then you have the cat, right? We are here. And then you have another class, which is machinery, which extends robots, which extends um, combat robots, and then extends with lasers. And then you, you say, I want a cat with lasers. Well, the, it's going to be a pain in the ass to, to, to merge everything. So with functional programming, what you get is just composition over the inheritance, right? Um, there are a lot of studies which actually merge object-oriented programming with composition. In JavaScript, for example, you can do it because JavaScript is not actually object-oriented, but prototype-oriented. But in classical uh, object-oriented languages, you, can, you cannot com compose the, the, the different inert classes. Uh, composition, it's modular, it's cool. And then we get testability, which is a thing that is not very popular in the development world, but should be more popular. Uh, why, why it's very easy to, to test the, the functional programming? Basically because the determinism, right? Uh, uh, pure function is testable by itself because you know 100% true that for a given input, it will return the same output again. Um, but also it goes a step further because you can test things like the, like the prop types or you can embrace the randomness, right? I, I, I know because of the determinism, I know all that a function given an input will return an output. So I can, for example, on, on all my, my test suite, not, not test always the same steps, the same mocks. I can passing around, I don't know, for the sum, I can say I math random, then math random, and I expect to return an integer. Bigger than the first number. That's true. That's a condition, that's true. You can do it, you don't have side effects. So this is, Prop testing and it's a step beyond, right? Um, this is another thing that it's very easy to do. Is uh, in, this is flow? We, it, it's from Facebook and it's for add uh, static typing to JavaScript. So we say I have a p function which takes an integer, another integer, and returns an integer. So I will expect to throw an error if I pass it a number and then a string, right? If you put this in a whole system. What you get is with the prototypes, right? Or concatenating functions. Uh, I can catch bad uh, returns, bad errors, functions that are not working okay, side effects, race conditions, because the prototypes, they are not gonna be okay. And th this, this is super useful. This is a problem that I was fixing today, for example, at Toolbox, race condition, writing into a data database. It's one of the super problems, right? And we catch it because a thing like that because it should be returning a number from one to zero and it was a negative number. So jump, 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 all the lights turn on. And that's basically it. I hope you, oops, you should be moving. Okay. In case uh, you have more doubts, you can ask now. I hope you like it. Don't be shy. You have a question. You? Okay, so enjoy the beers and thank you for coming. <laughs>